All right. So uh, this will probably run about a half an hour, 40 minutes. Folks can ask questions as we, as we get to the end or along the way, it doesn't matter. Um, essentially, I thought I would take some time because I was going through, uh, it's been a while since uh, I did one of these um, sessions and I've been doing a little bit of work uh, within the application, uh, specifically around um, reporting. So validations, report writing, um, starting to rearrange kind of where some of those things live uh, within the application, making a few of them more standalone processes instead of being tied directly to um, information within the Mark Editor. Um, and I figured it was a good opportunity to kind of touch base with what's there as well as finish some documentation um, that's up on the website and then there'll be some video documentation here that'll be available for folks um, later on. Uh, also, um, I found that uh, as I did each one of these sessions, I guess back in April and May, um, one of the things that I got uh, out of it personally was um, folks writing to provide some feedback uh, specifically on um, other features or ways things that could, the, the tool could implement things slightly differently. Um, given that the report writing uh, is somewhat of something that was created, um, but then um, I haven't done a whole lot with it, uh, I figured this would be a good opportunity to, to um, uh, kind of walk through kind of where it is right now um, and then hopefully uh, as folks either play with it or hear about it um, that if they have some suggestions for how to integrate it into workflows or or places where there are some things that are missing um, that might uh, filter its way back and then um, we'll be able to uh, prove the way that it works for the rest of the community so that's kind of the that's kind of my goal here um, for uh, for this, so keep that in mind. All right, so what I plan on talking about specifically, I'm gonna talk about how MarkEdit's validation works, because I've been adding some new functionality to the validation tool and kind of how that gets implemented, turned on, turned off. Some stuff isn't turned on by default. Um, talk about counting reports, which um, generally show up within the Mark um, editor, but live outside as well. Um, and then spend the rest of our time talking about custom reports um, specifically around um, the new templating option um, and then the way that you can um, mostly helping folks understand what the three different custom reporting options are within the mark editor um, so then uh, you know folks can decide whether they're actually useful or um, uh, help me understand how to make them more useful for folks um, all right so Let's start with the Mark Validator. So the Mark Validator is one of these things that um, has been around for a while, um, provides a couple of different options. Um, so there are, um, inside the validation, there are three different validation options. There are validation options specifically for the rules files. Um, so rules validation, there's um, validation for structure, and there's validation for um, being able to remove um, data that gets represented as invalid within the, the, the tool um, based on the ability to either compile or be read um, from the tool. Um, this is one of those places where it's, it's interesting to note um, specifically for the validation. So I'm going to pop this up so we can look at it. Because I, I found that this over this summer, this has popped up a few times um, where folks have misunderstood exactly how this works. Um, Within the um, rules validation, Mark Edit will remember um, the last rules file that you use. Um, the tool actually has multiple rules files built into it. So one is Mark 21, is one is Unimark. Um, I've had occasions where folks have um, had issues with the validator because for some reason uh, the default um, validation setup gets set to Unimark. If you're using Mark 21 records, that's obviously going to be problematic. Um, so if you um, have issues with the validator, you should probably just take a look or just set it to Mark 21 if that's your use case. If it's Unimark, then to Unimark. Um, part of what the tool tries to do is when you set up that initial configuration, when you install the program and it asks you um, in some of the, the first steps, you know, are you using Mark 21 or something else, that helps it determine which rules file to offer by default. Um, the second thing that's important to note is in terms of how MarkEdit does this part of the tool, the validate record structure. Record structure validation is based on record type. 
um, and they do different things. So um, when you're breaking a record, um, say from a vendor, and that vendor has um, created a mark record that is invalid. So let's say the leader or the directory or something within the record um, is invalid. The tool will identify that um, in the MRC notation, the, the mark record, the binary rock record. It's validating for binary structure. Um, if you want to look at, say, for example, a dot um, mrk file so is there anything that um, then what mark edit's doing is it's looking to see is there anything within the record that's making it structurally invalid to be able to turn it back into a mark record so those would be things like um, dangling subfields for so fields that have like two a subfield marker and no um, subfield code but no subfield um, uh, indicator so like a dollar sign dollar sign would be um, uh, structurally invalid uh, one of the things that I've been doing within the application, though, is trying to blur some of those validation pieces because I've been finding that folks are getting um, confused when, say, you break a binary mark record that has, um, say, like a subfield, subfield A. Structurally, from a binary perspective, that's not an invalid mark record, but that won't compile back to mark. Um, so what the tool is doing now is in some of those cases, it's looking at hard to find MRK um, errors, structural errors, errors that would show up within the mnemonic file format, and will flag them within the validate record structure. So if in your binary mark record you had something that would allow the tool would allow the tool to break the mark record but not bring it back, um, those are being flagged as well. Um, they're not being flagged during the initial process, so like during the normal uh, make and break process, it, because they're valid records for making and breaking. But if you were to check the structure of the records through the tool, um, the tool will start to identify those um, for you within the, um, the, the output that gets generated uh, as it assesses record structure. Um, that's been one of those changes that I've been trying to make um, specifically to help folks because those kind of errors really are hard to find. So within the, the validation tool um, for the rules, for example, the tool allows you to set validation rules that looks for the presence, the absence, the pairing of fields, fields that are um, deprecated, um, length of subfields within um, uh, control values. So say, for example, in the, the 007, um, or 006 to, within a particular format, see if the, the field matches the, the length. Um, it also provides options for um, customizing what data you want to output it to the, um, uh, output it in the report through user-defined fields, as well as then options to allow it to quickly check for duplicates, um, invalid UTF-8 characters, which is new, um, and then allowing you to group um, different types of errors um, together so you get different kind of outputs within your reports. So the rules file format um, basically breaks down to there are two sections within the rules file. And I'm going to pull this back up. So the rules file is essentially a text file that is broken up um, by tabs. Uh, so that the application can um, uh, read and sort out um, the data elements. The application um, will, at this point, if it tries to process a rules file and the rules file is invalidly formatted, um, it will try and go back to um, the last known good rules file, which is probably within uh, what's called MarkEdit Mark edit shadow configure directory. So there's a configuration directory that's that's created when you install the application and when you update the application that includes a master set of configuration files. And those configuration files are, are the last known good files at the point of installation. And so anytime you are a new user that logs into the application and starts up MarkEdit for the first time, it goes to that set of um, uh, shadow config files, master files, and pulls those into your user profile. 
So when markedit tries to process a, um, a rules file, if that rules file fails, it'll go back to that last known good configuration file and pull it in. Um, so if you make a mistake editing the, the rules file, it should be able to correct itself um, and flag the, that there's an error in, in place. So the tool has um, this structure here where the first three, four, five, six, 12 lines, however many you wanna have, um, these first lines up here are uh, special fields. So this defines um, uh, 1xx, so this is, there can only be one of these, so it essentially defines main entry. What's the main entry point? Well, you can only have one of these. What's the um, uh, title? And so you can specify, um, like here, um, different uh, multiple fields that could be potentially the main entry or the title. It's just the assumption is there's going to be one of those. Um, and that's a, an error that it'll, it'll generate if it finds them. Um, if you want to check for dedupes, um, there's this dedupe element, and then it sets which fields are being used for deduplication. Um, you can turn those on, off, or um, specify a specific, a just single specific field that you want to use for deduping. Um, and then if you want to output specific data as part of your report, you can use something um, user defined, and then um, list the uh, fields or subfields that you want to output. So let's say I wanted, let's say I was, I have um, a record number that's in like a 906 subfield B, um, and then I can enter in the record. So there's tabs in between those elements. And so I can define a user defined field, the field that I want, field subfield that I want to have um, pulled into my report and then um, the description of what that element is. And I can add as many user-defined fields as I want. The tool will treat user, essentially reads these first bytes until it gets to a first, until it gets to a blank line um, as part of that special configuration for the rules file where it's looking for specific things like main entry title, user-defined fields, and deduplication information that it's gonna use as it processes the record. After that, the tool will go through and it reads essentially the um, rules for interpreting the record itself. And these again are tab delimited. So you have a field number, um, whether the field is repeatable or not, and then a description of what's there, um, whether there are indicators that can be present, and then whether there are subfields. So in this case for control fields, there's not. Um, I've tried to provide examples within the application that shows how to set things for like length. So this is a, a validation for the 007 that will also check length using um, the uh, format codes, a colon, and then the length of that data that's in the, col the format code. Uh, sometimes we have data files, data formats that can be multiple lengths and be valid. In that case, you can put a, um, a pipe in between two length elements and the tool will um, validate for either um, to see whether or not the, uh, the links are correct. And then we can indicate um, for variable field data um, subfields that are um, valid within the tool. And then for those tools, those, those subfields that are valid, any rules that apply to them, so whether they're repeatable or non-repeatable. Um, so that way they show up um, as they're assessed within the record. Now you can create a rules file that is as large, so covering um, the specification or as small as you want. And in fact, a lot of people, when they use the validator, um, will create rules files that are looking for specific fields. They will set specific fields as um, required. And essentially what they're looking for is to see if the vendor provided specific field data and if that field data is formatted in the structure that they're looking for, um, as well as maybe looking to see if there are any due duplicates have sorted their way into, um, into the, uh, the application. So when these settings, so when these rules files are set, um, you can essentially go and collect yourself a, um, a file. and process it, the tool will go through and read um, the individual records and then create a um, rules file that it'll provide. So in this case, um, looking at 
the fields that were set as match points for criteria. The tool believes that um, there is a duplicate record and the duplicate value that it's matched on is um, this particular piece of information. So you can actually search for it to see uh, what are the pieces that what are the potential match points that are causing problems so that way you know why it thinks that uh, there's duplicate records. Um, you can also see um, how the, the individual um, output for errors are being defined. So in this case it gives us the 001 of the record if it's defined, the 245 if it's defined, and then it tells me um, what are the invalid pieces that it believes are found within this particular record set. Um, if I want to go to those records, you can see that there's a link that's been created. So this allows you to say go through a record set, find a record and click on it. And the tool will then um, open that record set within the mark editor um, and take you to that record so that you can assess it and make changes to it if you need to. Um, you can save the outputs um, or copy them or print them. Um, say you wanted to see it in a different format, you can um, rerun the error and group them by errors, so rather than by record numbers. So if you wanted to see types of errors, so in this case we have um, errors that are grouped by record type. Uh, the title and the port didn't match the one that you put. Yeah, um, I noticed that too. It looks like the count was one off. Um, the, re the record is actually the one below it. So I was going to take a, I'll take a look and see um, if the, uh, the counting, uh, a lot of things count from zero. And I'm, I'm thinking that the count on that might have been a count from one. But the title in the report was the, the record right below it. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking is probably happening is it's a, it's a count off by one. So I'll take a look at that. Uh, so you can see here that it's giving uh, types of validation errors. So you can see all of the different OO1s that uh, include um, this particular type of grouping. Um, and in this case, I probably should remove that because that's not applicable really within um, the grouping style here. So that gives you um, different types of doing rules files. So one of the new things that I added to the tool um, has been the ability to um, find uh, data that has uh, invalid characters. I'm gonna use um, an MRK file that is work on MRC files as well. Um, and let me grab, oh, that's wrong. This is a Unimark file, so it's going to have a lot of errors attached to it. But what I am looking for is um, where is it? Which file I was going to look at here. I started doing this. That's bigger than I want, but I will grab one. Just a So what I'm looking for is the, the I have a set of couple files that have um, invalid characters. I was hoping to, I should have actually thought about looking these up before I did this, but there's um, the, one of the new options within the tool is um, the tool will, if the tool recognizes that the file is um, UTF-8, um, it will attempt to determine whether or not 
um, UTF-8 characters within um, the file are valid um, and will provide a warning um, for uh, data sets that uh, have UTF-8 characters um, that are uh, not appropriate uh, within the, the Unicode um, format. Uh, so the idea is to hopefully help um, users identify up front uh, when that happens. I should have the stream rather than just dump into a file to be faster. Make a note for improving those large files. Let's try update that. I'll let that think for a minute while I go on. We'll go back to it. Uh, so this is an example of the uh, the columns and spaces. So we've got tabs, so that way you have an example of what that looks like, um, and then what it looks like here with the knees. Um, all right, character counts. Let's do the next part. Let's see, are we still thinking? We're still thinking. Good lord. Different version. While it thinks about this stuff. Big file. Uh, all right, so um, field counts and characteristics. So um, the uh, field counts should be fairly straightforward. Um, most people, when they're within the Mark Editor, uh, I think uh, are aware that if you have a file, go to reports and oh there we go so here we go so here you can see um, what happens when it finds invalid characters it tries to show you where it shows up within the field um, so that way uh, uh, you have a ability to be able to tell um, when invalid characters show up so um, that's a new part of the tool um, I'm going to show you quickly how you can deal with those if you find them in there all right so the field counts uh, most people probably know that what these are. They show you the occurrence. You can actually create reports for them, um, XML, HTML reports, material types. Uh, the tool doesn't have to run these. I, this is a change. I pulled those outside of the validator. So now you can run these in this generate report section. Um, so you can run a field count report on a particular file and output the data directly. So you can output those directly, so you don't have to hold on to them. Um, but this also is where you can get other kind of reports. So there's a report here for file characterizations. Um, this is actually for being able to um, process data within a folder and get information about that particular set of data that's there. Um, let me find one with a short, I don't wanna run this across a ginormous folder, but let me just take a peek here. I can find something with, that's uh, too many words. Let's say here too long. Uh, do, do, do. Let's try this one, just take a small set here. So you can either run the characteristics on a single file or we're gonna process by folder. And so we'll take this and then we'll go Just this folder, Let's see what's there. We'll output to characterizations, process it. And so the tool will go through and look at the individual files that are in the folder and then generate a list of characterizations for you that tell you how many records are in the file. Um, what's the file size, um, when was the last time it was updated, and what's the file name. So um, there are a number of times where I'm working with large sets of records that are in a folder, and this is gives me a quick way to get a snapshot of what's um, within the folder that I'm working with so that I can get an idea of what, what kind of record sets are there. Uh, 
And then material type reports are basically the same kind of report that you get um, within the applications uh, editor. And then for examples, I have here some uh, snapshot for you. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about custom reports because this is what I wanted to spend some time on. So the application has three different custom reports and these were written with specific use cases in mind, um, specifically for folks who had questions um, related to how to get information about specific data. Um, and so uh, I'm not quite sure if these are if these are two use case specific or not. So this is part of what I'm trying to sort out right now. So there are three different custom reports. One is search within records, one is information about records, and then one is the custom reports field itself. I'm going to give you an idea of what each use case looks like. Um, so that way we can um, talk about whether or not this is actually too narrow um, of, a, of an approach. Um, so I'm going to throw a set of records in here. All right. So the first one is to search for data within a record. So um, the idea behind this particular function was let's say you wanted to look at um, all of, you wanted to get a report on all of the different languages that say were within um, a record set. Um, so actually, let me get a larger record set than that because the, some of these are easy enough to eyeball. Let's just grab. that one, larger record set. Um, so let's say I wanted to find out what languages were there. So I can do a regular expression search um, for languages within the 008. And save those out. using a regular expression, I can determine which piece of this regular expression I'm interested in. I'm in the second, so group one, group two, so I'm interested in the second group. If I want a total count. I'd like to know how many records it shows up in. I can run that process and the application will now go out um, and try to process this request against um, the record set that I, I've given it. And this will just take a a second for it to go through. So it went ahead and processed the record set. So what I get um, in the output is the criteria that I used, um, the total number of times it was found, and in the, within the total number of records. So in this case, I've got um, these particular elements um, in this many record, this many times, and within this many records. Um, so that's um, um, in an 008, I would expect to find just one of those, but let's say I was looking, say, like in an 007 or a repeatable field, um, I would be looking for something potentially where the, the, the total and the, the, the total number of records um, would be different. So this allows me to create reports um, about particular characteristics um, within a record set and get counts about those so that I can learn things about record sets really quickly. The other report, uh, custom report, was designed to um, be able to learn things um, about the record itself. So in this case, I, I'm interested in learning um, about the number of um, fields within a record. So uh, when I'm dealing with, say, large sets of um, digital records, they may come with um, lots of subjects or they may come with lots of um, headings and so I'm, maybe I'm interested in understanding um, what are the um, what are the field characteristics within those sets so that I can understand the, the threshold count. So in that case I may do something that looks more like this. Um, where uh, I'm going to set a control field, so that's going to be the data that I'm going to use to identify um, the record as a match point. So if I knew it was a control number, I could, but I could also use like a 245 
Um, I think I can use subfield codes in there. Um, set a threshold, and then um, I can set greater than or less than. So I'm going to say greater than, say, three. I want to see all the, the things. And then I can search. And again, let the tool read the data that's in the, um, the Mark Editor. This will just take a second. And then we end up with a characteristics report where it shows me um, a record number, a control value, which apparently I probably can't use subfield codes on, um, the field uh, number, and then the number of times that it shows up within the, the record. So in this case, record one, um, there are for some odd reason, five 082s within that record, um, five subjects. So this gives me an ability to be able to just quickly see um, within a set of thresholds if there's anything that stands out. So there are 20 um, ISBNs apparently in record 46. Um, maybe that's okay. Um, I don't know. So so that's kind of what this this characteristics report is set for. So I can set my threshold. So three is probably a lot smaller than what I would usually look for. Maybe I'm looking for something very large, um, to see if anything stands out um, within the, uh, the record set. <clears throat> and then the last one, the custom formatting is really put together because maybe everything that I've put together so far <clears throat> doesn't work for you. So the, the, the searching within the records, the search by records, material types, um, exporting, tab delimited, none of those um, are, are applicable for your results. Um, and so you're interested in doing something else. So that's what the custom formatted result re re reports tools for. Um, in this case, you have to tell it an awful lot about what you're doing um, unless you want to use a template, which are new. And the templates are something I'm going to talk about a little bit here. So um, we set a place to save our reports. Um, we tell the tool um, what kind of arguments we want to have. So what are the fields we're going to collect? And then we set the output. So we set the formatting. Um, the tool here has uh, the defined fields that you've created. So it creates kind of a template of what that might look like for tab delimited. So 001, 245, 090, subfield A, um, or the subfield U. Um, there are formatting options though. So let's say you only wanted parts of some of those fields. If you click on this link, it'll take you to the formatting options. I'm trying to add more formatting options to Custom Report Writer. So in this case, you can see that you can add tabs with a slash T, but you can also use regular expressions. So you can use regular expressions to extract out um, parts of an individual field. So if you wanted to take a call number, for example, and extract just the first part of the data. This gives you a regular expression that shows how you would extract just the number and leave off the rest of the data. Um, so this would give you some flexibility to say that you would like data coming from a particular field, maybe say like an 008, but you only want um, the values that are in the language element. So you could create a regular expression that would then extract out just the data elements that are in um, the uh, byte uh, 35, 36, and then the three characters. So that way you could um, generate those within a custom report. Um, and so the tool provides some examples of what you might do with that. So um, let's say you wanted to output a barcode list. So here's an example um, using a record set uh, where <clears throat> the tool is generating so let's say the barcode is, uh, in this case, the barcode was structured in an, o, in an 001 for this example. 
um, I could use a regular expression to actually reformat the data in the 001 so that it gets outputted um, in a barcode format. So this is a very narrow use case and one that actually this report was written for where I had a set of records that was coming from a, a place where the barcodes were um, placed inside the um, <clears throat> 001 and they were looking to convert the data. So in this case, you could output the data from one field and then use a regular expression to completely restructure the data that comes out and put into the report. Um, looking for, say, like a call number. Um, this is, was kind of the first look at, like, say, like you wanted to create a call number spine label. Um, I could use the 005 um, regular expressions to extract out bits and pieces of a, um, a call number, use the formatting options slash ins, um, represent new lines uh, to generate a tool that formats a report that looks like this, um, using the formatting options to say that this needs to be 11 lines long, blah, blah, blah. So giving you some formatting options there out. And then delimited options. The tab, sorry. So that gives you some functionality in terms of being able to output data um, in a different specified formats um, and hopefully be able to access any of the data within the, the record set. Um, but sometimes you actually have, I, I, I've been having folks ask specifically about um, the ability to output um, uh, call numbers within a specific type. And these seem to be things that were regular. They're well-defined structures. Um, they can be kind of written using the custom report writer, but they also have things like variable data. So um, like printing out a call number for a label, the call number may show up in multiple fields um, and you want some kind of way to determine order of preference so that you can structure the output. Uh, so in this case, what I ended up doing um, was looking at creating a um, structure where the tool could use um, templates. And so these are well-defined um, rules that output different kinds of um, reports, column reports, um, of data. So let me um, do... Um, So let's say we wanted to output spine labels. So we don't have to worry about any of that kind of stuff. We just go to set formatting options and the template we're gonna use is spine label. So the, the way the templates work and they've been set up like this so that I can add additional templates is this piece up here, this down symbol um, creates a template that tells me that that's the, the template name um, for uh, that I'm using. So if you look here, you've got uh, SP lib, and then we've got um, four and six and um, I should have a pound sign from it. Um, so we have the, the template name, and then we've got the information about um, the variable data. So the call number, and then the different fields that the call number could show up in and then the order of preference. So in this case, the tool will output a spine label, um, generating it using the spine label format. So I believe that's um, nine characters, nine bytes wide, um, the first column being blank, and then I think it's 12 lines long or something like that. Um, so it's a common spine label format. Um, so we can save that and then generate spine label to that, that folder tool will go through an output um, there. Let's see. Maybe it shouldn't have that there. Yeah, I must have a file, I must have a file somewhere in the in the um, must have an error in my file somewhere. Anyways, it should generate a spine label format. Um, and I'll go back and look at these again, uh, make sure it's uh, a little bit more well structured. Um, yeah, definitely looks like it was um, something going on. So you can see that it generates 
tries to generate spine labels um, using uh, spaces to determine when to break. It wraps lines when it needs to. Um, and then we have different, grab a smaller file. Use a different template. Buggers. I have to figure out what's going on here. It's generating on some, it's going to be bouncing. I'll figure out why that's throwing an error. It shouldn't have been. It wasn't earlier. Something's going on. Anyways, it should generate templates. So the idea is, in theory, that um, you'll have these templates that'll be able to be called um, for use. Right now, they're just in the Windows version because I was playing around with them. But all the code's there to migrate them over to um, the Mac systems. And so they will be done this weekend. Uh, so these are examples of things. Um, uh, all right, so they'll be migrated over to um, the Mac version uh, this weekend with a couple other things. So I'll go ahead and take a look at the, on these files, one of why I'm getting the errors. So that way I can, um, most likely what's happening is there's some places within the record sets where it's pulling data. And um, I had some fairly, uh, fairly, I had real world data, but it was, it was pretty sanitized that I was working with. And so a lot of these files that I have here come out of um, files that people have issues with. So I'm sure there's some air checking that needs to be done within the, the processing to make sure that it's a little bit more um, solid. So it does, when it runs across errors, it has ways to, to bounce through them. Um, but anyways, so the, that's the idea of the templates. Now, one of the things I haven't quite figured out yet is um, assuming that something like a, a call numbers, those templates for generating call numbers are actually useful for folks where you would actually pull a record set in, you make your changes, and then in batch generate a large set of spine labels or book labels um, and spine labels that you could then print off, um, is how to figure out how to um, uh, take something like a custom formatted um, report um, or something that came out of a template like for a custom formatting report um, and put it into somewhere here so you don't have to go through like six clicks to, to get to what you want. Um, haven't really thought it through yet what that looks like um, for folks, mostly because it just got put in here, um, and whether or not there, there is a way to, to do that or um, ways that folks can think about what that might look like. Um, the other thing is I'm not quite sure if there are other templates that make sense, so what kind of like um, if there are other kind of like canned kind of reports that we make use of or they get made use of that would be um, applicable within this kind of structure or with this, if this is more of a um, call number kind of a thing. Um, I'm just not sure yet. Um, like I said, the reports, custom reports function was designed um, with some very specific use cases in mind. Um, I used it for a lot of other things since, um, but I think that uh, I don't have a clear idea of yet of where um, folks might make use of that. And then because of that, how to integrate it so that it's easy for folks to just use them. Um, so. so that's, a, that's what I got. Um, we're, uh, we've got a couple minutes. Folks have questions. I'm happy to answer them. Um, otherwise, um, I will um, post the recording when it's done. And uh, like I said, I will be continuing to work on some of the reporting stuff. The Mac reporting features will show up over the weekend. And I will spend some time looking at some of the tweaky things that we ran into in the session here. So that way they don't show up when people start actually trying to use this. Because um, like I said, this just got turned on Tuesday, maybe, I think. So, so I will wait a sec to see if anybody has any specific questions. If not, then we'll wrap up and I'll post this.
Okay. I think that's about long enough. So it doesn't look like there are specific questions. If you have them, feel free to forward them off to me. Um, otherwise, I'm going to stop the recording.